Hello, good evening, and welcome to our program at Home in the World, American Jewish Women Abroad, 1865 to 1940, hosted by the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society. My name is Rachel King. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Heritage Center, which is a destination for exploring and preserving the history of Jewish families and institutions in New England and beyond. We are an archive, educational center, and family history resource located at America's founding genealogical organization. Tonight's program is the Jewish Heritage Center's first Genevieve Geller Weiner annual lecture, the culmination of a new fellowship funded by our longtime advocate and supporter, Justin Weiner, in honor of his late wife. The Genevieve Geller Weiner Research Fellowship advances the study and understanding of Jewish history by annually supporting a scholar to conduct research in the GHC's archives. It seems fitting that our inaugural research fellow, Dr. Melissa Clapper, is a scholar of Jewish women's history, and that the subject of her research is how Jew Jewish women found agency and autonomy through travel and engaging with the wider world. I think Genevieve would approve. We are extremely grateful to Justin Weiner and the Weiner family for honoring Genevieve's memory in this very meaningful way. Before I introduce Dr. Clapper, I want to make just a few notes about this webinar. Uh, you in the audience will be muted throughout. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A panel, uh, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can following uh, Dr. Clapper's presentation. Please note also that uh, as we are all broadcasting remotely this evening, we hope you will bear with us if we experience any technological issues. Uh, and I know there's a nor'easter uh, raging through the Northeast right now. Um, so hopefully our connections and um, uh, Wi-Fi will all uh, cooperate. Uh, but even if we do lose the connection or if um, you miss something on your end, you will have access to the recording of this session afterward. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker and the 2021 Genevieve Geller Weiner Research Fellow of the Jewish Heritage Center. Dr. Melissa Clapper is Professor of History and Director of the Women's and Gender Studies Program at Rowan University in New Jersey. She is author of numerous books and articles, including the book Jewish Girls Coming of Age in America, 1860 to 1920, and Small Strangers, the Experiences of Immigrant Children in the United States, 1880 to 1925. Her 2013 book, Ballots, Babies, and Banners of Peace, American Jewish Women's Activism, 1890 to 1940, won the National Jewish Book Award in Women's Studies. And her most recent book, Ballet Class and American History was published by Oxford University just last year. Melissa came to Boston this summer to do research in the JHC's archives for her forthcoming book about Jewish women's travel in the 19th and 20th centuries. We look forward to hearing more about her research and some stories from the archives uh, this evening. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Melissa Clapper. Good evening, everybody. I'm so delighted to be here. It's really a pleasure to be the first inaugural fellow of the Genevieve Geller Weiner Research Fellowship. And I have a couple of thank yous I just want to make before starting on the program. So thank you to the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, especially to Executive Director Rachel King, Associate Director of Archives and Education Stephanie Call, and Senior Archivist Lindsay Murphy. Um, Stephanie and Lindsay in particular ran up and down stairs many times for me during my wonderful visit to the beautiful building where I did research in June. Um, it was a real pleasure to spend a week working there, and I, of course, was thrilled to finally get back into the archives. The pandemic has made it very difficult to do the kind of work that I'm about to talk about, and it was just such a pleasure to be there. 
And I'm also very grateful to Justin Weiner and the Weiner family for sponsoring the Genevieve Geller Weiner Research Fellowship. I'm truly honored to be the first recipient of this fellowship. So what I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about my current research project, At Home in the World, American Jewish Women Abroad, 1865 to 1940. This project is, as you can tell from the title, about American Jewish women who traveled abroad during the late 1800s and early 1900s. And I'm gonna show you some pictures, but before I even do that, I just wanna talk a little bit about how I came to this project. My previous work, as you just heard Rachel discuss, is largely about American Jewish women's history with some forays into the history of childhood and girlhood as well. And I noticed as I was doing research for my first book on adolescent Jewish girls in the United States, and then again with my book on American Jewish women's activism, that these people that I was writing about went abroad a lot. This caught my attention as somebody who has the travel bug myself. I love traveling. I love going new places. In fact, 2020 was the first time in two decades that I didn't get to go abroad at least once, which I certainly know makes me a very lucky person. Um, and so I was just, I was struck by how often these women seemed and girls seemed to be going abroad. And I sort of filed it away in the back of my head to think about some other time. I did write about Jewish women traveling abroad for international activism in my um, book about Jewish women in the suffrage, birth control, and peace movement, but that was not the major focus. And then I tend to like to write about things that nobody has written about before. And this is certainly a topic that no one has written about before. None of the research on American Jewish women's history written by my fabulous colleagues in the field really pay much attention to Jewish women who went abroad, even though they did in fairly significant numbers. And the general scholarly literature on American women travelers hardly ever mentions Jewish women at all, which sadly is not unusual for American women's history. And so I've decided that this is my new project. I have been working on it for a few years. I've been delayed by the pandemic, but this is will eventually be a book. And so I'm really excited today to be able to talk to you about this research. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that I can show you some pictures and talk about the kind of research that historians do. Wait a second. Yeah, it's going. Okay, the kind of history um, that research, excuse me, the kind of research that historians do, and the kind of treasures that I found at the Jewish Heritage Center during my fabulous week in Boston. So, let me talk first, very briefly, a very brief history of modern travel. It's something it's worth pointing out that until the middle, really closer to the end of the 1800s, not very many people were able to travel abroad from the United States or elsewhere. Travel was really something, it was very time consuming, it was expensive, it was slow. It was really only available to people with pretty significant financial resources. And it also depended on the geopolitical situation. In other words, you really wouldn't travel when a war could break out at any moment. So for instance, in Europe, um, continental travel was really not so common, even for people who were going on this so-called grand tour, until after the Franco-Prussian War, when there was a protracted period of peace starting in the early 1870s that allowed for more travel, particularly from England to the continent and vice versa. And so things that you wouldn't think about actually had an impact on travel. For instance, very, no Americans basically traveled abroad during the Civil War. If you lived in the Confederacy, you were blockaded and couldn't get out. And you lived if you lived in the Union, this was not the moment to go gallivanting anyplace else. And so the time period that I'm most interested in is the period that starts after the Civil War, when the world is actually at a relative moment of peace, or I should say the Western world, the world that most um, of the travelers from America were going to. There were also things that were changing during this period that made travel a much more common activity, not just for the elite, maybe not for people who were working in sweatshops. Recent immigrants to the United States very rarely wanted to travel back as tourists to the places that they had left, although they did sometimes. Jewish travelers were less likely to do that. I'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. But there were certain technologies of travel that made travel more democratized during this period. And, the, and scholars of travel do refer to this as the democratization of travel, sort of a mouthful, when mass tourism started. One of those was just the basic technology of getting across an ocean and the new ocean steam liners that were often referred to as quote unquote floating palaces. These floating palaces are the kinds of ships that maybe a lot of us think about when we think about, say, the Titanic. 
didn't end too well for those people, but the idea that there was this ship of great luxury and a ship that could get across the Atlantic in significantly less than a week, or at least that's what was supposed to happen. So starting from the 1880s and onward, the amount of time that it took to get across the Atlantic on a ship was cut quite sharply. This meant that for travelers, the travel time itself, although still much more significant than it would be today, of course, didn't actually have to figure as much into their travel planning. It wasn't as crazy as maybe it, would, it used to be to, let's say, go to Europe for only a week or even 10 days if it didn't take as long to get there, although many people did go for longer periods. And so the floating palaces with their great luxury still catered to the elite, but they also had a new class of accommodation. Typically there was first class, there was second class, and then there was something above steerage called tourist class. And tourist class was often shared cabins, even for single travelers with shared accommodations. These were not fancy state rooms that had their own bathrooms, but they were actually kind of affordable, even for middle-class Americans, and maybe even for working class, the kind of the upper layer of working class Americans who, if they saved up for long enough, might be able to take the one trip in a lifetime. So there were still people who were summering in Europe every year and going abroad every summer on one of the floating palaces. But on those same ships were people paying significantly less, getting clean and pretty safe accommodation. And then once they got to their destinations, also taking advantage of the new tourist class in hotels and in trains. So this enabled a whole new era of mass tourism. It's an example of how technology really had an impact on people's lives. And there were other technologies related to travel that also made travel more appealing. One of them was just the idea of photography. Of course, photography was not new in the 1870s and onward, but it was eventually reaching a point where a regular person might even have a camera. And so I've just given you one example here. This is just one of the, my favorite pictures that I found at the Jewish Heritage Center, even though it's not a woman. The man on the right is a man named Charles Davis. He was from Cincinnati. He was, his, his family had a cigar business and he and his brothers in the business had a deal basically that every few years, Charles would take a major trip somewhere in the world. And he really did travel around the world. This picture, as you can see, was taken, well, maybe if you can see, was taken in Japan. I could spend an hour just talking about what's going on in this picture. In some ways, it's very problematic, <laughs> um, but it's also kind of fun to look at. So that's Charles Davis on the right, standing with a fan and the parasol, um, being Japanese or being what he, the word he would have used at the time would be quote unquote oriental, um, kind of dressing up in this way. And I have found in almost all the archives that I visited, pictures like this that show people dressing up and taking on the persona of the place that they are visiting and generally um, you know, acting, acting up while, they, while, they're on, while they're on their trips. And so for all these reasons, technology enabled travel to become much more common. And that was true for American Jewish women as well. So American Jewish women who traveled abroad went for a number of different reasons. The first was sightseeing. They just went as tourists and they went all over the place. I would say the majority of the women that I have discovered in the archives were, went to Europe, but a significant number of them, of Jewish women, also went to Palestine and to Egypt. Those were trips that were very often combined with each other. That was true for Christian travelers as well as Jewish travelers if they went that far. A number of them went further into what was then known as the East. They would go to Turkey in particular, but also to Syria, what we now know as Syria and Lebanon. Some of them went to Latin America. There was a number went going to Latin America. There were intrepid Jewish women travelers who went to, again, what they would have called the Far East or the Orient to Japan and to China and to India, particularly Japan and India, actually. And then there was a very significant number of women who went to Palestine. So some of these women were traveling for sightseeing. Some were going to study abroad, particularly in the late 19th century. The higher educational opportunities for women were opening up in the United States, but for advanced graduate study, it was still often easier to do doctoral programs in Europe rather than in the US So that for women. So there were women who went abroad for that. There were people who were making family or home place visits, immigrants or the children of immigrants um, from the 19th century on who were going back to the places where their families were from to take a look, visit relatives. There were people who were traveling for activism, who were attending the international conferences, for instance, of the International Women's Suffrage Association or the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom or eventually the World Council of Jewish Women. And there were people who went abroad for some period of time to work. 
Um, it, I probably I this is this project is not fully developed yet, but I am I think I'm probably going to include women who went to abroad to work for about a year and a half or less. And we'll still count them kind of as travelers, even though they stayed in the same place very often for a period of time. And many, many of these women kept records of their trips. The image that you see here, which is in the Jewish Heritage Center collection, is the travel diary of Edith Retschewski. She, uh, she and her husband Abraham went abroad many times, but this particular travel diary, which is a very typical sample of what these things looked like, this particular diary is from a 1911 trip that she and Abraham took to um, Europe and also to Egypt and to Palestine. So what kinds of records did Jewish women keep? And this is a really important question for historians. The records, the documents, what we call the primary sources, the original documents, that is the very stuff of history. And historians like me just love to spend time in the archives digging up the treasures and taking a look at what you can find. And I have found a number of different categories of documents that I want to talk to you about today just to tell you a little bit about what kinds of information you can get about Jewish women who traveled abroad. So one is passports. Now, before World War I, it was not always necessary to get a passport to travel across various national borders. But after the war, um, as countries were sort of reassembling themselves, as new national governments were establishing themselves, in part because of the still lingering finger uh, ideas of kind of hostility <laughs> among various countries, getting a passport became a much more required experience. Um, typically, in the period that I'm looking at, up through about World War II, you would basically have to get a new passport for every trip that you took. That's a pretty general statement, and expert might quibble with that. But this is an example of a passport that Gussie Weiner, as in the Weiner family that so generously sponsors this fellowship, that she got, that she had to um, ask for and to kind of file for in 1927 when she and her daughter Frances were getting ready to go abroad on a long summer trip. It was sort of a package deal that they went on actually, a cruise that included travel components of the Southern Mediterranean. And they went to Greece, they went to Italy, they also went to Egypt and to Palestine. And I know you probably won't be able to see this so clearly, but I just want to point out that these passports like ours today include a photo. So here she is, a photo. You'll note that Gussie, her name is Gertrude, but she went by Gussie, and that's the name that she signed here. Um, you'll note that she's wearing a hat. These days, you would not be allowed to wear a hat in a passport photo, but that was okay at the time. You'll note that she had to put in her height, okay, the color of her hair, the color of her eyes. If she had had any distinguishing features that would have gone in here, her place of birth, the date of her birth, and her occupation. And you'll note that she wrote in housewife which is kind of interesting that that is accurate, but of course it does not at all do justice to the many, many activities of Gussie Weiner when she was at home. Something else to note and that and a part of this passport was the visa, the visa forms that you can see to the right of this image. Um, you can see it's dated in Boston for June 1927. And what's interesting here is that there were places that she went on this cruise that she and her daughter went, for instance, Italy and Greece, where just the passport and a basic visa would have been okay. But there were other places that she was going, particularly Palestine, where she actually needed a separate visa. And you may not be able to see this so clearly, but the image does say that this visa is not valid for Palestine, nor would it have been valid for other parts of the Middle East, like Iraq. She had to get different visas for that. So looking at a document like this actually gives you a lot of information. It gives you information about what the government wanted to know about its citizens as it traveled abroad occupation, for instance, which does not appear on our current passports. It shows the various stamps that we used to get wherever you went. Okay, which, and if you look closely at those, you can often figure out the dates of a trip, although in this case that was not necessary because there was also a pamphlet, a brochure from the trip, so I was able to track where they were going, when they were going. And it also tells us something about, again, geopolitics. Where was Gussie Weiner allowed to go as an American citizen with this passport and visa? Many places, but not everywhere. So this passport happens to be the original one, happens to be um, in the archive, which was great to look at. It is also the case that there are passport registries available online through internet databases. And so one of my longer term goals um, for this project is to take a look at a lot of those passports and see over time how they changed. I, might, I, I haven't decided yet quite how to do this, but I'll probably take a few people whom I know traveled frequently and take a look at what their passports looked like over time as they traveled. There were also cases, as we will see later, 
we're going to look at another passport image later where when men and women were traveling together, they sometimes had a joint passport that was typically primarily in the man's name. But in this case, because Gussie was going without her husband, George, but with her daughter, she had got her own passport and her own solo photo. So passports are one great example of a kind of source that historians can use to learn about travel. Another source is postcards. This is a postcard from Athens. You might recognize this uh, famous image. And this is from Frances Weiner, who was traveling with her mother, Gussie, on that same trip I was just telling you about, writing back to her husband, uh, excuse me, her father, back at home and telling him how amazing it was to see in person all these wonderful places that she had read about so many times. How grand and noble it was, she said, to see the Parthenon, to see the Acropolis. And so postcards were also often shared. And what's interesting about something to remember, to keep in mind about archives, is that if I'm seeing something in an archive now, that means that somebody made a decision, not just to write it, but someone else, or maybe the same person, made a decision to save it. And so when you look at a collection like the Weiner family collection, and you see that there are a lot of postcards from all over the world from various family members, that tells you not only that the family members like to travel, but also that they treasured the, what, what came out of that, that they kept these things. And I've looked at collections in many, many archives of a lot of postcards. They were really meaningful to people. So the same way now that if you get if you get a postcard from a friend, if anyone sends postcards anymore, you might put it up on your fridge for a while, but then you'd probably get rid of it. Well, don't get rid of it. It's a historical source and somebody might be interested in reading it someday. So postcards are another great example. They show um, images and also postcards were particularly important, um, I'd say before about 1900 or so, but certainly before World War I, when most regular tourists would not have had their own cameras. And therefore, if they wanted to send pictures back, they usually use postcards to do that. The Kodak Eastman um, company was, was developing at the turn of the century individual sort of casual user consumer market cameras, often called brownie cameras or box cameras. They took square pictures. You might have seen some of these in the past. And a well-heeled tourist after about 1900 was likely to have a brownie camera with him or her during travels and then could take their own pictures, but still postcards were a useful way and to get shots like this, which would have been extremely difficult for an amateur photographer with a brownie camera to get postcards remained valuable as examples of uh, or, you know, evidence of the kinds of travels people were going on. Another source and my one of my personal favorites, I love diaries. I've read diaries for all my books. I really enjoy reading other people's diaries. Um, I often get asked if I kept a diary myself as a kid and I really did not actually, uh, never lasted more than a couple of days, but somehow I've ended up as somebody who reads a lot of people's diaries. And a very typical travel diary would look like this. It would have the date, you know, just basic information and then you know, a limited amount of space to write. Now you may notice when you're looking at this diary that there's actually two people's handwriting here. This is the diary, the diary that was jointly kept, I just wanna get the dates right, by Leon and Julia Obermeyer, who were big travelers. Okay, they married in 1923, and after that, they took trips basically annually. Interestingly, they almost always stayed in the Western hemisphere. They went to Cuba, they went to Costa Rica, they went to Panama, they went to various Caribbean islands. Um, they went to Argentina. They were interested in Latin America, primarily. They spent a lot of time in Mexico. And they went on cruise-type uh, trips almost, almost annually throughout the course of their marriage. And what was interesting to me about this diary is that both Leon and Julia wrote in this diary, which is something I have to say that I had never seen before. It's not that men didn't keep travel diaries too, of course they did, but I had actually not seen before a diary where both the husband and the wife were keeping the diary. And you can also sort of see that they're writing it really for posterity. Um, if you'll note on the left on Monday, January 28th, 1935, Julia just is writing about Leon, right? Leon is reading the Guatemala book aloud and we both find it very interesting. They're actually en route to Guatemala at this point. And then the next entry on Tuesday, the 23rd is written by Leon. And he actually even puts the time date, the time down, 10.45 a.m. on deck, right? He's telling you exactly where he is. And so these are the kinds of things that also not only the people themselves, but their families and friends just treasured when they, that when they got back, they read them, they reread them, they poured over them. They sometimes, um, in this case, the Obermeyers, 
use their own diaries for suggestions for their own future trips. They would jot down you know, things that they wish they had done or things that they hoped to do again next time they came back to the same place. They actually did visit the same places several times, which was not always the case for travelers. Um, and this also note that this is 1935. It's actually, you know, sort of the depths of the depression, but the Obermeyers were a pretty well off family. He was a lawyer in Philadelphia and they were able to travel continue their annual travels pretty much throughout the, um, throughout the depression. So diaries are another great primary source. Another source that I found some really wonderful things of, where some examples of were letters. This is a letter written by Ella Davis. Ella Davis was the daughter of Charles Davis, whom I already mentioned, and she got the travel bug from her father. Um, she was born in 1885, and in 1910, 1909-1910, she and her father took a trip together. And it was originally meant to be around the world, although they, in the end they came home early, and I'll talk about why in a moment. And they spent many months, though, abroad in Europe, in Egypt, in Palestine, in Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. And while she was away, she wrote a constant, constant stream of letters. Now, it is clear from the letters that are in the collection at the Jewish Heritage Center that she was writing letters to family members as well. The letters that are in the collection in Boston, though, are almost all to her, uh, let's call him her boyfriend slash secret fiance. And again, I'll speak more about this in a minute. Nathan Isaacs back at home in Cincinnati. They met each other as college students at the University of Cincinnati. And in these letters, she wrote in great, great detail about their trip. And something I just want to point out about this letter, you may not be able to make it out, but down towards the bottom, she's talking about being in Constantinople, which is, was still the name of the city at the time. And she says, Saturday night, we had Seder with some people, okay, um, whom Mr. Seinfeld met and sorry, met at, at the synagogue. They are Spanish Jews, she said. David Levy is the, um, fellow, is the fellow father's name. And then the bottom part of this says, we went to the synagogue. Something that is very noticeable to me as someone who's reading a lot of this kind of material is that wherever Jewish women went when they traveled, they did Jewish things, whether or not they did them at home. So even women who never set foot in synagogues at home, and that does, you know, there were a number of American Jewish women for whom that was true. When they were abroad, they went to synagogue services, they visited Jewish cemeteries, they marked Jewish holidays in their diaries and their letters, again, whether or not they usually celebrated or observed those holidays at home. They sought out other Jewish people. And there was also, especially in the summers in Europe, and also to a lesser extent in Palestine, especially after World War I, there was a kind of Jewish circuit of travelers, people who often saw each other, even if they weren't from the same place back home, who would run into each other pretty regularly. So there was a whole Jewish social scene of American Jewish travelers that I'm finding very interesting. But what's especially interesting to me is whenever I find places where, as Jewish women were abroad, they, what we would now call, did Jewish. Right? They were doing Jewish things while they were abroad. So in many ways, their trips were actually very like the trips of other American women of their similar class background in terms of where they went, the kinds of sightseeing they did, what their behavior was like. Um, everybody was a little looser on shipboard, for instance, than they were when they got to where they were going. But Jewish women's trips were definitely distinguished by Jewish elements. They did Jewish things on their trips. And this is very clear. Um, here's Ella Davis celebrating Passover while she and her father are abroad. Okay. My PowerPoint seems to be a little bit stuck. No, there we go. Sorry. Okay. Something else that is wonderful about the collection at the Jewish Heritage Center, particularly this collection, Ella Davis Isaacs collection, is that it contains both her letters from this trip, this 1909 to 1910 trip she took with her father, and also her diary. I can't tell you how exciting it is for historians to be able to compare sources that do things in different ways. So let me just, I have to move my window down a little bit. So something that is noticeable here is that I've just read you a little piece of the letter where she talks about the Seder that she went to in her diary that covers the same day that she wrote in Constantinople. You'll note up at the top, she wrote in Constantinople on the dates. She says at the bottom of the right page, April 23rd, Saturday, Saturday, Pesach service at synagogue, Spanish Jews, meaning Sparty Jews, basically, although her identification of them as such is possibly a little iffy considering the fact they were in Turkey. 
um, Seder with Mr. David Levy. And here she actually says in Istanbul, which is a part of Constantinople and partially why we now have the name Istanbul for this city. And so we have this ability to compare. And I have found in other archives some wonderful examples of the same people on the same trip writing letters and keeping diaries and sending postcards. And they don't always seem to have the same experience. And I imagine many of you listening today have had this experience where you've done something with family members or with friends, but your recollection of it or your experience of it isn't quite the same. And so for a historian, it's like finding a gold mine to find these comparative kinds of sources. Now, something that comes out of all of these sources is the ability to tell stories, to tell stories about the past. And so I'm actually gonna spend a little bit of time now, just for a little while, talking about the story of Ella, of Ella Davis. Here is Ella Davis again with her father, Charles Davis, who might recognize him from the picture with the parasol and the fan in the Japanese setting. You'll note this is, um, this is actually a visa, but you'll note that their picture was taken together because they were traveling together. Ella is wearing an entirely fabulous hat, okay, in 19, and she actually spent quite a lot of time shopping for hats while she was in Europe. Um, shopping does take up a certain amount of time in her, in her diary. This is a fairly well-to-do family, not super rich, but certainly with the means for, to go shopping and enjoy experiences while abroad. Okay, this, um, this you can see from the date, this was taken, this image was taken in December of 1909, um, and then they come back from their trip in May, they, they come back through Seville where this was, um, stamped in May of 1910. So there were places they went more than once on this trip. Now this letter, like the other letter I showed you, was sent to Nathan Isaacs. So Ella Davis and Nathan Isaacs met at the University of Cincinnati as college students. And Ella had already graduated from college by the time she took this trip with her father. And something that completely baffled me as I was reading my way through the letters not so, and through the diary was that for some reason, Ella's parents, and it seems that Nathan's parents too, disapproved very strongly of their relationship, which had already been going on for a few years at the time that she took this big trip. And eventually they were, I mean, we know, I, know, I knew this in advance, she and Nathan did get married. It's a little odd. Nathan was, as the saying goes, a nice Jewish boy from Cincinnati. He graduated from college. He finished law school. He actually graduated from law school while Ella was away on this trip and then started a law practice. By the time she got back, it was already clear he was going to be successful. The family was, well, the, both families were prominent members in the Cincinnati Jewish community. Why in the world were their families disapprove? And when you read the letters, it's very clear that they did. Ella and Nathan were actually engaged by the time they left for this trip, but she it was a secret. Her father did not know that. And it drove her father crazy that she was constantly, constantly, constantly writing to Nathan. How do I know that? Because another batch of letters in this in the uh, Weiner Heritage Family Collection, okay, is um, Charles's letters from the same trip. And he was writing back to his wife saying, I just don't know what to do with her. You know, she just, she's obsessed. She thinks of nothing but Nathan. And in fact, in her diary, Ella wrote repeatedly that she was not, she was having trouble focusing. She couldn't really enjoy the sights. She, you know, she, she just wasn't having a very good time. She, and there was a lot of tension with her and her father, especially when they had to share a room, which they did at some of the places that they went, sometimes to save money, sometimes um, because there was no room in the hotel, literally. When they went to Egypt, for instance, they stayed in a famous shepherd's hotel, which was the place to stay for Western tourists going to Egypt on their way to the pyramids. And they had to share a room that they hadn't planned to share. We're not too happy about it. And Ella is constantly writing letters. And it eventually, it, it gradually became clear to me that the reason why both sets of parents did not approve of this relationship was something really interesting. Ella writes in her letters again and again that she's trying to honor Nathan's wishes. What are Nathan's wishes? That while she's on this big journey, he understands that she's going to be sightseeing and doing things on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. But he really hopes that she'll limit it and that he, she would, should never write to him on Shabbat. And this made me think about, think, look further into the families. And it turns out that Ella's family was a classically reformed family. They were kind of Cincinnati classically reformed. And Nathan's family was quite traditionally observant. Uh, the word Orthodox with a capital O is maybe not the best word to use for 1909, 1910, but they were traditionally observant, ritually observant. His family kept kosher, they observed Shabbat. And he didn't love it that she didn't grow up that way, and he wanted her to become more religious. And it seems that this was the tension. His family didn't like the fact that she did not grow up observant. 
her family was horrified by the idea that she would become more observant than she had been. And so there was constant tension on this trip when she tried to, that her, she tried to make it such that her father would not notice that she was not writing on Shabbat. She was not writing letters and trying not to write in general. She was um, going to synagogue services more often than she ever did at home. Now, again, many Jewish women travelers did that, but it made her father very suspicious about Nathan's bad influence as far as he was concerned. And because she was constantly writing to him and she didn't always want her father to know about it, many, many, many of these letters end in the way this one does with a paragraph that says, I'm so tired because she was running around all day being a very busy tourist with her father who didn't want her to miss anything. And then she would stay up late at night, sometimes in hotels with a certain amount of electricity, the more often candlelight she's writing these letters by, and she just wants to make sure that she can write to him. And she wants to make sure that, he, that Nathan knows that she's always thinking of him. So, and she says at the end of this letter, just smile at me, please, and tell me that you love me. Oh, I love you so much. Kiss me good night, dear. God bless you. And then we have this sort of strange set of circles, dot, dot, dot in a circle. Kiss, kiss hard. <laughs> um, I won't spend, and, you know, if there's a question about this, I can talk about it more. But basically, the, this couple had a code. And the little uh, circles that are showing there have to do with kisses and hugs and other intimate touching. And they, um, this is their code for you know, goodnight kisses in a way that she wrote. And in every letter, she goes on and on and on about how much she loves Nathan, it, you know, to the point where I went, I actually said to Stephanie, to the archivist when I was there, that at a certain point, I might have stopped reading it. It gets a bit much. <laughs> but he's writing letters back to her. They're also full of love and kisses with their own little uh, code here. So when you look at the kinds of sources that I found, when you look at the sources for travel, the passports, the letters, the diaries, okay, the memoirs, you know, all this kind of material, you really learn about people's individual stories. So I am trying eventually to tell a larger story about American Jewish women's travel. There are you know, larger issues that I think that looking at Jewish women's travel reveal. They reveal about Jewish identity and about gender identity while traveling. They tell us something about diasporic Jewish communities and the kinds of connections that were enabled among them by the growing ability to travel during this long period between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Second World War. There's issues about kind of immigration and migration. This is a moment when, huge, well, through the 1920s, when huge numbers of, of course, as you all know, Eastern European Jewish immigrants are on the move and they're going to the United States, but also other places like Argentina, for instance, is one example. And travel is another way in which Jewish people were on the move in this period. And it really created more of an internationalist outlook. And that's something else that I'm interested in exploring. And so when I do research in the kind of archive that I was so lucky to spend a week in this summer, what you learn are these larger kind of macro issues about identity and gender and travel and an internationalist outlook, the uh, connections among Jewish communities. This is particularly important for the many, many American Jews who visited Palestine during this period and the pre-state period. Um, relatively few American Jews went to live in Palestine, although there were, of course, you know, exceptions, the most famous one being Henrietta Zold, who was a friend of Gussie Weiner. Um, in fact, Gussie actually asked Henrietta Zold to look in on Gussie's father and brother who had moved to Palestine. They actually did make Aliyah to spend the, um, their, late, their latter years learning in a yeshiva, and she asked Henrietta Zold to look in on them, which she did. So there were a few Americans who moved to Palestine, but there were far more who went as tourists and sometimes as philanthropists and activists as well. And so there's these larger issues. But what I try always to remember as a historian is that history is about people. It's about people and their stories and what we can learn from their stories, what we can learn about them, how we can think about the past, how we can think about the people who are not so unlike us, even though they live in the past as a different country, as is famously said. And looking at these different kinds of travel documents really allows um, to work to kind of to operate on both levels at the same time to be thinking about the bigger picture, but also the smaller picture. And when you look at these literal smaller pictures, you really learn a lot about the past. And so working on American Jewish women who traveled abroad has enabled me to tell stories about new people and new ways and as they went to new places and did new things. And that's something that's very exciting to me about this project. So as I continue to work on what I hope will eventually be a fifth book, which would show up on a slide like this, 
I'm really committed to looking to, to working with archivists and collections all over the, all over the country. Actually, I'm doing a, a kind of national project. I don't want to focus only on um, American Jewish women who lived in the Northeast in places like New York and Boston. It's, this is a national story. Ella Davis from Cincinnati was not the first or the last woman from a Midwestern city, for instance, to travel in this way. So I'm interested in eventually writing a book that will, you know, do several things. It will for the first time look at these stories at all no one has written about american jewish women as travelers in this way but will also tell us something about the human impulse to travel to go new places to do new things but to do that within the cultural context from which people come which in the case of american jewish women was very much a jewish context and that to me is something really interesting to think about it's some it's almost this universal impulse to look for connection wherever you go and that is the very essence of the story of people and something that I am really interested in sharing. So I'm glad to have had an opportunity to talk to you today about the different kinds of sources that I found, the treasures that are in the um, Jewish Heritage Collection at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. And I want to thank, um, again, the Weiner family for funding the fellowship that made my research trip there possible. And I look forward to continuing to work on this project and to telling you more about it in days to come. Thank you. Melissa, thank you so much. That was so interesting and such so tantalizing. Um, I think we all want to read your book. Um, <laughs> and I know it's um, it's still a ways off. So there are a number of questions coming in. Um, I did wonder first, um, you did mention that you've been working on this for um, a couple of years. And, you know, of course, the pandemic um, reached uh, wreaked havoc. Um, oh, before before we get to questions, I was just going to mention to the audience that um, um, the Jewish Heritage Center is offering a course starting next um, week. We've been looking at uh, Jewish immigration to America, and this is the second installment um, in that survey. Um, so we are starting a course next week. Um, the Yiddish of Yankee Land, the Jews of Boston in America, 1840 to 1924, specifically looking at immigration during that period. And and to um, the specific experience of, um, of the Jewish community in Boston. Um, so that starts uh, next Tuesday and it will be held over four Tuesdays. Um, we hope you'll join us. Um, so back to questions. Um, I, I wondered um, if you could tell us a little bit um, about your research methods. Um, I know the book is um, uh, probably not out for another couple of, of years at least, um, but if you could tell us a little bit about your research process and, um, you know, if maybe, uh, and you did tell us also about the, the origin of this idea, um, but if, if along the way with your research, um, if you've had any surprises or anything that sort of led you to change course a little bit. Um, so tell us a little bit about the process. Okay, well, um, I actually saw in the Q&A that somebody asked a pretty technical question about my process. And I'll just say about that, um, anybody who, <laughs> any scholars who are online are about to just, you know, shake their heads in disbelief, but I'm a very old fashioned researcher. I use index cards, I take notes in pencil and archives on index cards. I have my own whole system. I will not explain it here. It is not what anybody else does anymore, but it works for me. Um, so that is what I do. And I can use that system, you know, in a bunch of different directions, but it is certainly not what I expect my students to do. They all, you know, actually most of my colleagues also laugh at the idea that I do everything in longhand. I also write the first draft of all my books in longhand, which, um, horrifies my husband, actually. <laughs> Truly, he just can't believe it. Um, but that's what works for me. Um, but what I usually do is, so first of all, at this point in my career, I have visited a lot of archives. And so I have, I don't necessarily know, you know, how many diaries are exactly what I'm going to find, but I do often have a sense of where the good places are to go to find materials. So this was the first time I'd had the, um, pleasure of coming to the Jewish Heritage Center, but it's not at all the first time that I've done extensive research, for instance, at the American Jewish Historical Society from whence the Jewish Heritage Center kind of originally, originally came. And so there are certain places like that in the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, where I know that when I go there, I'm going to find a lot of material. The research process is very different now than even it was 20 something years ago when I did my dissertation research, because the materials themselves are not online. They are hardly ever digitized. 
as it happens, the Jewish Heritage Center does have digitized versions of many of these documents, which is extremely rare. It is ex very expensive to do that. And it's often not worth it for an archive because no one's going to look at it, maybe one person. I would say, in general, because of the kinds of things that I write about, I often look at materials that no one has ever looked at and probably never will again. So it's often not worth it for the archive to digitize everything. But you can now use finding aids and catalogs in order to know what is there before you go. And when I did dissertation research in the mid to late 90s, that was not true. You sometimes you really had to be in touch with archivists in advance and you just had to you had to spend more time first even knowing what was there. And nowadays that process has been considerably streamlined, although the best person is always the person who has been an archivist for a long time and really knows the collection. They are the researcher's best friends. Um, and so that's, that's always very important. So wherever I go, I usually go to both the Jewish archive in town and the, so the non-Jewish archive, so to speak. So as an example, in Baltimore, I went to the Jewish Museum of Maryland and also the Maryland Historical Society. Not all Jewish women's papers at all end up in Jewish archives. They could end up anywhere. And so I've been to some interesting places on the hunt for this kind of material. And although I, I have found a tremendous amount of material, it is all, that just means that there was that much more once upon a time that did not get preserved. And so it's always interesting to think about. So in the case of Ella Davis, for instance, we have all of her letters. It's a little unusual. Often um, in a kind of love letter type correspondence, it's usually the woman who saves the letter. So you have more men's letters than women's letters. That's just a reality um, of sort of love letter kind of correspondence. But in this case, Nathan certainly, Nathan saved them as they were coming in and also their travel logs. I mean, she was writing for them to be saved, at least for them to look at together, if not for some smarmy historian a hundred years later to look at. And so there, there is actually quite a lot of material, but it does take digging and creativity and, you know, willingness to run into problems and to see, you know, what is or is not available. And sometimes there's questions that are just not answerable. And I, this is a longer answer than I will give to any other question, but I think it's worth talking about. An example of something that I wish I had more material about is sexual activity while traveling. Um, it's clear that there are a lot of shipboard flirtations and this kind of thing, but there's a certain point at which the sources are just sort of either silent or trail off into dot, dot, dot. And there's no way to really know what happened. And that's, I, I'm hoping I'll find more of that type of material, but it's unlikely that people actually wrote about it. And so I may just not be able to, and I'll have to sort of read between the lines to think about the way that being on a ship, for instance, really loosened people's usual standards. Yes, there are those silences in, in the records that we wish we could, um, we could find out more about. Um, well, maybe related to that that uh, last point you made, um, we have a question. Can you speak to the safety of some of these women who may have traveled without having um, male um, companions with yeah. them? Travel was actually fairly safe. And women traveled in a lot of ways. Some women traveled with family groups, some women or you know, with, with just with husbands or with um, you know, direct relatives or in larger family groups. Some women traveled with tour groups. So when Gussie and Frances Weiner went on that package tour, they, they went to, you know, as relatives, of course, mother and daughter, but they were also on a package tour. They did a lot of things together. Some women traveled with groups of other women and some women did travel alone, right? And travel was actually pretty safe. Because of the development of mass tourism, there was a sort of systemization of travel that made it quite safe. There were places where women were more likely to be bothered on the street. This is just as true in 2021 as it was, let's say, in 1921. And women typically knew about that. There were all kinds of guidebooks published specifically for the woman traveler, just as there would be today, although these days it's more likely to be a blog um, than, you know, or a podcast than it would be a book. <clears throat> but it was relatively safe. I have found, at least in, in the sources I have read, which are at this point quite extensive, I have found relatively few cases where women felt unsafe. And due to the gender norms at the time, women who presented as quote unquote respectable typically were pretty safe. And if they felt unsafe, all they would have to do was look for a respectable gentleman who would probably help them out. So even if they were traveling completely solo, they were typically pretty safe. 
This does not mean nothing bad ever happened. Things happened. People were, you know, there was pickpocketing. People were mugged. I have several cases of theft, actually. That's the most common thing. But relatively few women feared for their safety. And the uh, brochures and from the, the guidebooks, the guides, the ship materials from the shipping lines all emphasized how safe it was for women to travel alone. And if they felt unsafe, then Thomas Cook and other tour operators, you know, promised absolute safety for women. And there was there were hardly any examples of women being attacked if they were on that kind of tour. Excellent. Um, we do have a question that I can answer. How did the archives of the Davis um, and Isaacs families from Cincinnati end up in Boston? Um, it was because Nathan Isaacs ended up at Harvard as a Harvard professor. Um, so their their story, I think, ends in, in Boston, um, that there are uh, Cincinnati-based uh, parts of it as well as these travels. Um, so there are some questions about, um, Myra says, I do Jewish too when I travel, even though I'm not observant at home. Um, so this is really fascinating that, that women would seek out these Jewish um, sites and, and experiences, even if they were not particularly active at home. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and whether those experiences abroad um, might have inspired any kind of, um, you know, observance or what they might have brought back with them from those experiences. Yeah. So as far as I can tell, it did not, when Jewish women who, um, who were not particularly observant or connected um, in a religious way, went at home, went abroad, and then did something Jewish, went to a service, um, you know, observed Rosh Hashanah, looked for Jewish groups, it did not necessarily translate. And I want to emphasize, I'm talking about people, in this case, I'm talking about people it kind of ap really in religious terms, because most of these women were connected to the Jewish community in some way at home, but relatively few of them were really totally cut off such that it was a radical decision to do something Jewish abroad. But a lot of them did, observe, you know, if not, um, not traditionally observe necessarily the holidays or Shabbat when they were abroad, but they did go into synagogue spaces. They went as tourists too. I mean, there were some synagogues, for instance, the um, old Spanish Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, which most tourists, to Europe did. So one of the guidebooks for women that I read, for instance, and it's, you know, descriptions of what to do in Amsterdam mentioned going to that synagogue just to a general audience. So it's not surprising that Jewish women would, of course, do that kind of thing also. And sometimes they were really quite fascinated by what they saw. Um, this is also true, I, I guess a lot of my examples have been from Western Europe, but a lot of Jewish tourists and non-Jewish tourists too, especially again after World War One, did go to Eastern Europe as well. And there also, they um, would go and sort of observe Eastern European, what they thought, what to them felt like, quote unquote, authentic Jewish life in a shtetl or something like that. Sometimes it was where their own family was from. Sometimes it wasn't. And they just wanted to go see what Jewish life looked like. Another reason why Jewish women tended to do Jewish when they were abroad was actually a less happy reason, and that's anti-Semitism. That there were, you know, Jewish women encountered anti-Semitism when they traveled. They encountered social anti-Semitism on ships. I have a mother um, who was right, who was very upset that nobody was asking her daughter, who apparently looked Jewish, whatever that meant, <laughs> to dance on shipboard because she was Jewish. She was also disappointed that the Harvard and the Yale fencing teams were on that same ship, but none, none of them were Jewish, so no good prospects there for the daughter. Um, you have, you know, so there was a kind of social sort of genteel anti-Semitism, if you want to call it that. There were more, there was more egregious anti-Semitism as people traveled. Um, a number of Jewish tourists went to see the Passion Play. I'm going to butcher the name of it in Germany in Obermagau. I'm going to say it fast. That is not how you pronounce it. I'm afraid I can't pronounce it correctly. Um, and that that has you know traditionally been an intensely anti-Semitic uh, perspective on the crucifixion. And you know, but they went. But Jewish people went to it. Actually, they all then left horrified. But they they went in large numbers. And some people even planned their trips. It was an every ten year thing, and people would plan to go that year. And there were also, and so for some of these people, even um, one, one example in particular, a woman named Rebecca Auerich Raher was going, went to South Africa in 1924. As a, she wanted to be a journalist. She was hoping she would go write a bunch of articles, sell them to magazines when she got home. She really was pretty alienated from her Jewish background. She didn't deny being Jewish, but it meant very, very little to her. But she confronted so much anti-Semitism on board that as she, basically as she got off the ship in Cape Town, she immediately, it was Rosh Hashanah, and she immediately went to services. She immediately went to the synagogue. Mm -hmm. She just wanted to be around other Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And that didn't necessarily carry over hugely into her life immediately after. Um, she did go to Palestine a few years later. That's a whole other story. But, but 
it's it, anti-Semitism is something else that kind of brought out the Jewishness in people's experiences. And they did, you know, Jewish women studying abroad encountered it in Central European universities, the um, big international conferences of the suffrage or the birth control or the peace movements were threaded through with anti-Semitism. And that was another Jewish experience that women had as they were traveled that, you know, sort of highlighted their identity for them. Um, we'll, we'll take time for another couple of questions. Um, so Sally actually asks, were there any tours specifically designed, um, as there might be now, sort of Jewish tours um, or specifically designed to go to Jewish sites? Yeah, so not in the earlier part of the period I'm looking at. After a while, the trips, to the, Thomas Cook in particular, they made, you know, the mm. most important kind of international tour operator based in England, did start to have some trips to Palestine for, for the first number of years that they had Palestine trips, they were really organized completely around Christian pilgrimage. But they began to see that there was a market for Jewish tourists. And so they began to cater to Jewish tourists as well. There, there weren't that there weren't really Jewish tours in the way we might understand them today, but the shipping lines were aware of a Jewish market and had several sailings a year, both to Europe and to Palestine, where kosher food was offered on board on board the big, you know, Cunard, um, you know, or Atlantic shipping lines. And so there, they were trying to cater to it. Now, they weren't very successful in offering kosher food. I found um, the memoir of one woman, a traditionally observant woman going to Palestine with the intention of staying there to live. And she signed up for kosher food and then did not recognize the fish that was served to her on day three, only to discover it was crab. And she and her companion were actually both physically ill at the realization they'd had this and they just had bread, water, and fruit and vegetables for the rest of this trip. So they weren't necessarily successful in providing kosher food. Um, some places claimed rabbinic supervision. So they don't have Jewish tours in the way we would understand that today, really, although groups could organize, smaller family groups could organize their own tours back to their hometowns in Central or Eastern Europe. But it didn't stop people from doing Jewish things. And in Palestine, there, especially in the, to the 20s, there was a sort of established Jewish circuit of sites to see, comparing the so-called old Palestine, things like the Western Wall, with the new Palestine of the agricultural colonies, for instance. Uh, terrific. Um uh, one question, we've had a couple of requests. Can you um, repeat where you can find passports online? Yes. So the place to find passports online is through Ancestry.com, um, or at least that's the place that I know where to find passports online. There's a database. It may be available um, in, other, in other places, but there is a kind of national federal database of passports that is part of Ancestry.com. It's one of the uh, many, it's one of the things that you can search there. You need to know you know, you need to have the name pretty much correctly spelled in order to find it. It is helpful to have some idea of dates. If there's if there are names that are very common, it can sometimes be a little harder to figure out who you're looking at, but you can generally get there because there is personal information on those passports. Some years are better covered than others, but that is where you can, that is where the passport database is on Ancestry.com. And perhaps this question will um, be a good final one. Um, have you come across any instances where a Jewish woman traveler met her Beshert abroad? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> in fact, I have. There were certainly people who went abroad in the hopes that that would happen. There were also young people like Ella Davis who were sent abroad in the hopes that they would find somebody and or find somebody more suitable than the somebody they currently had. Um, I'll give you an example, a man, uh, an example of a man, actually. Um, Harry Friedenwald from Baltimore was the, his, he was from a kind of a, a established Jewish family in Baltimore, and his family is very close to the Zold family, uh, Henry, as in Henrietta Zold, and he and Henrietta were close friends, and although the parents were also all friends, and the families were friends, she was older than Harry and not a very prepossessing looking person, according to Harry's mother, and he, when they sent, when the parents, Aaron and Julia, sent um, Harry abroad, they really wanted him to find somebody else there. And anytime his mother heard about other nice young Jewish girls who were traveling abroad, that's, that's one of the summers, she would write to him, sometimes telegram him <laughs> and say, oh, you should go, you know, the so-and-so is gonna be in Venice the same time as you, you should all get together. 
and he did often, he did, you know, he did in a social way. Um, that is actually not how he met his wife, although his wife, Bertie, did also travel quite a bit. And then they, as as married, as married couple with their children, they went abroad quite a lot. Also, I have some fabulous pictures from some of their travels. And so there were people who met their, you know, met their intended, but, and there were people who tried, like who were going abroad for <laughs> that purpose. But I actually think I have found just as many examples of parents sending a young person abroad to get them away from somebody. <laughs> um, and sometimes effective, sometimes as in the case of Ella and Nathan, not just to round out their story. They did of course get married, but not for a couple of years after they got back, after Ella got back from this trip, they faced just a lot of family resistance for a long period of time. Um, uh, so they had their happy ending, but not without family turmoil over a number of years. So travel did not solve everybody's problems. Well, I'm grateful to Jonathan Sarna, who fills in a little bit of the story as well. In addition to the Orthodox reform difference between Natha and Ella, their marriage was an early example of a Russian, Jewish, German uh, intermarriage. Uh, sorry, Russian, Jewish, German, Jewish intermarriage. Nathan Isaacs descended from Orthodox royalty. Um, and interestingly, Nathan brought Ella to Orthodoxy. They lived a ritually Orthodox life, very rare at that time for a Harvard professor. So just to bring our audience a little bit into the future after that, that uh, fateful yeah. trip. They were, involved with the young, they were involved with the young Israel of Brookline. Yeah. But, so, it tells us something that her family was so horrified on all these fronts that they tried to get her away from it. <laughs> well, Melissa, thank you so much. Um, this has been fascinating. We look forward to um, uh, reading your book when it comes out. All the best for the um, rest of your research and for the writing process. And we're thrilled to get this um, early um, early preview. Um, so thank you. Uh, and if you're interested in um, uh, purchasing Melissa's most recent books, um, we are sharing um, some um, uh, some information on where to find them and um, some discount codes to go with them. And um, so I hope you will all take advantage of that. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, when you leave the webinar, you will be asked to take a brief survey uh, about the program. Uh, we hope you'll take a couple of minutes um, to fill it out as your feedback is very valuable to us as we develop uh, further programs. Uh, we will also be sending you a follow-up email with the link to this presentation. Um, I want to thank once again Justin Weiner and the Weiner family for their generosity in making this program possible. Uh, and indeed, it is support from people all over the world that makes uh, free programs like this one and um, all of those from um, New England Historic Genealogical Society, American Ancestors possible. Um, so we do hope that you too will consider making a, a donation um, and you can do that at jewishheritagecenter.org slash donate. Uh, thank you. We hope you'll join us again soon, perhaps next week for our course. Uh, and in the meantime, we wish you good health and a happy remainder to the, of the autumn season. Thank you and goodbye until next time. <laughs>